I uh, appreciate everybody being here. Um, this is kind of reprising something that we did in uh, Austin. Uh, and uh, what we are doing is kind of living in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, the history of open source, um, of what's happened uh, in terms of litigation, what's happened in terms of threat uh, uh, and the, the menace of, uh, of patent litigation uh, that existed 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about how threat has evolved and what we're doing in a very specific way to deal with uh, is where threat is most acute right now, which is with non-practicing entities, patent assertion entities, patent trolls, uh, entities that, uh, that don't have the same uh, uh, mindset and are not influenced by open source in the way that, uh, that operating companies uh, like Microsoft uh, that has made an amazing transition over the last uh, five or six years in particular uh, are, are or were influenced to become more, uh, uh, more community oriented and, uh, and more focused on, uh, on living within the, the confines of the community in terms of code of conduct, set of norms uh, that, uh, that are now considered to be uh, ingrained within most of the companies that live in the, that come from the operating space. And so uh, we'll, Basically, Karen Copenhaver is here. I'll have Karen introduce herself and kind of her, her historic role. Uh, and uh, Justin will introduce himself. And then we'll have uh, Sean from Unified Patents introduce himself. And then I'll talk a little bit about context of where we are, why we're here, and, uh, and then what operationally is going on that allows us to mitigate risk in a very uh, precise way against uh, very uh, potentially damaging patents that are held by non-practicing entities. That's going to be the primary focus of the discussion today. Uh, and if you have any questions, don't stand on ceremony. Just ask them. Just raise your hand or just blurt out what you want to say. Uh, we're very happy to have a, a, an, open, an open dialogue with you. Um, like any environment, we get energy from your questions and from your interest in the things that we're doing. Um, this is our day job, is to, to clear risk, to make sure that the space is safe for adoption and to encourage more and more projects to be launched by Linux Foundation and other organizations in the world that are very successful and have been very successful over the last 15 years in particular in, in being the authors and managers and professional, professional uh, advocates for, for very significant projects uh, in the open source world. Karen, you talk about your historical. Karen has a long standing history, which is very, very important for you to understand. <laughs> well, I have been working with open source since the late 90s and working with the Linux Foundation from the beginning and working with OIN from b the beginning as well and aware of what they were doing. And first I want to say that um, whenever I talk about OIN, I fear that I am going to uh, reduce its, uh, its, its role because I'm trying to be simple about what they're doing. I, one of the wonderful things that Keith has brought to OIN is a flexibility in, and a, um, an opportunistic uh, way of approaching risk. So whatever I say is very simple. Realize that there are many layers of other things that Keith has been doing over these years to uh, address risk. And this is one terrific example of how we've uh, taken a new step. But what, if, you, if you think about open source as, um, you know, from the very beginning, they, they were uh, worried about patents. You know, as you read the GPL, you know they were worried about patents. The right approach with, with patents at that time was to build a community of really patent owners who were dependent and vulnerable to, to each other because of their dependency on these open source projects. And of course, these companies had owned and, and uh, felt the risk for patents for many years. That was a slow process. I think ideally it was addressed through this separate organization that could bring a level of patent savvy and a connection with people within the corporations that had uh, a, a deep knowledge of patents, the value of patents, what was happening with patents. And it's just astounding how successful Keith was in building that community response to patent risk. That was the essential thing that uh, he was working on as he built these licensees, built familiarity. And the benefit of that was that as new industries came into open source, they could see what, was, uh, what existed. They could see the level of support. It was apparent. You could look at the licensee list. You could look at the success. You could look at the sponsors. 
And that, more than anything else, could allay their fears that this was such a different business model that weren't they a little bit uh, it, you know, it, reckless if, if they joined in. So when you think about industries that came in later, industry, particularly like the financial services industry, et cetera, the existence of OIM, the community response to that risk, the sophistication of the approach to patents, the collaboration among all of those parties was fundamental to their coming in to, uh, to open source. And it was, I think it was perfect that it was separate from the development work because uh, the, there actually are very different people involved in that. So now we come up and we say, uh, say where, you know, where we are today. All of that time, the developers, not the corporate patent owners, but the developers have always wanted to address the, the problem of patents at its base. That there are patents that were issued for software that never should have issued. That, you know, that there was an approach to patenting that was ad hoc at best in the beginning, and those patents still exist and are getting transferred. And what I love about what we're going to talk today is that now we go back and address this fundamental concern that the developers have had from the beginning. And the key through providing this collaboration at, as a, um, among all these companies has been able to bring companies together to fund this work by some of the most sophisticated patent uh, attorneys on earth in terms of addressing these issues. So I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long um, a path to this, this wonderful outcome. Um, so, hey, I'm Sean. Uh, I co-founded a company called uh, Unified Patents, and Unified Patents has been around for um, actually almost 10 years now. Um, and we largely started because of a change in the uh, patent system in the United States. But going backwards, as, as she was saying, um, patents have been around, obviously, for a very long time, and they have a very important public policy issue or solution, is what they're trying to do is encourage disclosure and in exchange for that disclosure you get kind of exclusivity for a certain amount of time. Um, the problem has been over time especially in the tech space that there's been a strong incentive to get as broad a interpretation of your patent as possible way beyond what you actually invented and a lot of times that means that the patents are not valid um, which means that you know there has been prior art as they call it that exists that covers a lot of the patent that you're getting. You might have started out with something very specific, but you end up with something broad because that's what everyone's goal is generally because you want as much real estate as possible. And especially in the tech space, that happens frequently. And what that means is that there's tons of patents out there that have pieces that are not very valid because there's other people who had those ideas before them. Um, and that happens in standards, it happens in open source, it happens in tech all over the place. And you usually don't know that for many years later. Now, in the past, you know, 20 years ago, that didn't really make much of a difference because most companies basically just kept their patents kind of like an iceberg in their portfolio and they just kind of traded them back and forth and that just kind of existed in and of itself and no one really cared. But starting about 20 years ago, what happened was that iceberg kind of like global warming kind of started melting and people started selling these things to different people and not just to other operating companies but to what they call non-practicing entities as well and these non-practicing entities went out and then they started essentially suing people in order to reap you know the money from it and there's an inherent in asymmetry in that market because the cost of litigation and even to find out if a patent traditionally was invalid was really high it would cost sometimes millions of dollars to prove that in court in the United States. And there's a lot of risk associated with it because you're talking about very sophisticated language that frankly even I sometimes don't understand what's being said in these things. And you're asking a jury or a judge to figure that out. So you don't have a very clear idea and you know, you're asking people who don't have a very clear idea for results on something like this. So you get all kinds of random results and uncertainty. And so these non-practicing entities are working on kind of a, what we call an asymmetry in the marketplace, which is you have a lot of uncertainty and you basically end up in a situation where you're spending a lot of money and you might not necessarily know what you're going to get at the end, even though you might do a great job or try to do a great job. So 
most of them settle. That's just generally what they do. And so what that resulted in was this like, huge increase in litigation, especially in the patent space in the United States, for non-practicing entities that were essentially buying. Because you can just assume that there's an unending supply of patents in this world that they can use because it's just everywhere and everyone is willing to sell them for very cheap at this point. Um, and they ended up suing to the point where about 95% of the litigation in the United States, even to this day, in the tech space is non-practicing entities at this point. Um, and most of those patents, if they were challenged, would lose in a challenge, but just it's just not economically viable. So there was a change in the system, and the change basically made it easier to essentially invalidate patents. And so Unified kind of got created in that process about 10 years ago to kind of help what we call deter kind of invalid assertions by nine processing entities to stop these kinds of invalid assertions from happening. Now, if you have a valid patent that's completely on point and you know you there is no what they call prior art on it, anyone should be, in w our opinion, should be able to monetize it any way they feel like, wherever they feel like. But the unfortunate truth is that most of these patents are not very valid. And they're just there, but no one actually expected to monetize them. And suddenly you have someone who is, and they can sue not just one company, but 20 companies. And most of those companies don't want to spend the money, and so they settle. So that's the asymmetry that they end up making money off of. And so our job is to go out, identify these non-practicing entities in the areas that we protect. Our members pay us a subscription fee for this, for the areas that we protect. And we basically are intending to deter these guys from actually buying these patents in the first place. And by saying to them, hey, listen, if you're going to invest in a patent, either invest in a valid one that you know for sure is going to survive any challenge, since we're not going to challenge it if we can't find anything bad on it, or no one else will either, or B, just go to a different area and buy stuff in a different area that has you know, valid patents or whatever. But just don't buy it in this area, essentially, and don't try to assert it, because these guys are making purchase decisions, investments just like you invest in real estate. They're buying intellectual property, and then they're monetizing it through law firms. So that's what we did. And then we started talking to Keith um, and the Linux Foundation, because what we did notice, especially in standards and in other areas like open source, that there was an increase in assertions. And that's primarily because of the success of open source, frankly speaking. You know, as more companies implemented open source code in full implementations and weren't customizing them, them as much as they were before, um, and they were just taking the packages and they were putting it in there and they were kind of touting it as something that made they were compatible with, you know, like a kind of COVID, you know, they would just latch on to that. You know, a patent troll would, or a non-practicing entity, we call a patent troll, by the way, my definition, because a lot of people have different ideas of what a patent, our definition or my definition of a patent troll is just a non-practicing entity that's asserting what we believe is a bad patent. That's, it. that's a very simple way of thinking about it. And so when I think of a patent troll, they're like latching on to that technology that they see everyone advertising. And they know then they can go after a large swath of companies at the same time and survive long enough that they can get settlements from them. And that's kind of their basis for doing it. And so we saw an uptick in kind of open source specifically because it was getting more and more popular. So we went to Linux Foundation and we went to Keith and we kind of, in OIN, and said, listen, this is a problem. We have these other areas that we've done. Can we do something here? Is there a solution that we can work with you on here? And you know, we talked back and forth. We had done some um, invalidity, um, essentially, uh, analysis in the past and um, invalidated a few open source patents just because it was tangential to some other technologies we were protecting, for example. But we started talking to them about what we call creating a zone. So we created an open source zone specifically for this area. Um, and it's a little unique because it requires a little more complexity. First of all, it covers a lot more companies than we're typically used to because we're including everyone in uh, Linux Foundation, everyone in OIN, basically, for everything. So it's a much more complicated picture. Um, typically, we would settle these cases in some cases, and we would just pull the kind of invalidity in exchange for a license for all our members. But practically speaking, that's just not possible when you have you know, 10,000 companies involved that you're settling with because no troll is going to want to do that because they're basically eliminating every single company from, you know, it get, taking a license at that point. 
So first of all, we have to go through the whole process of invalidity. It's like going to trial for the entire time. So there's a cost associated with it, which is quite a bit. The second thing is it takes time. And you know, we gotta make sure, pretty sure that you know, you're gonna win. Luckily, we're pretty good at that. We win, like every time we touch a patent, we win 19 out of 20 times. So we're pretty good at doing this once we touch a patent. By the end, touching, like we touch it. Um, uh, you know, but you know, to get to that point takes a lot of time, preparation. So we have different processes for that. We actually crowdsource, which is really great. So we have a whole solution around crowdsourcing, which is a lot cheaper than just killing the patent or eliminating kind of that area. We basically can go out and we can kind of um, reduce the risk by basically just publishing prior art on it. So everyone can see it. So there's no question about it. And that actually solves a lot of problems too in the process. Because we can basically uh, you know, show that the through prior art and publish it without having to go through the whole process of actually going to court and showing that the patent is bad. We can actually deter a lot of companies from actually asserting it and eliminate their ability to have leverage. Because a lot of the time it just takes a small company or a large company a lot of money just to find out if a patent is not that good in the first place. And we do that work for them. And then we publish. So people make money off of it because they have, you know, they get thousands of dollars in rewards. And we basically can publish this information. Then. So we do that. And then we also, you know, eliminate it. And ultimately the goal of all of this is to deter kind of assertions in this space. And so we're constantly getting feedback from our members, including OIN, including Linux Foundation, including anyone else who wants to give us information. And we get demand letters and all kinds of other things in this area. And then we you know, collect that information and make sure that then we kind of find patents that aren't you know, very good. And then we publish as much information or we challenge them. And ultimately our goal is to say to these people who are making purchasing decisions, just don't do it. Just not in this space. If you're going to go out and buy a patent and make an investment decision, you know, go buy real estate or something like that. But if you're going to buy it in this space, it's probably not going to work out really well as you thought because it's going to cost you a lot and you're probably going to lose. Um, anyway, so that's – yeah. And that's kind of what gets done. Karen, did you have a comment? Uh, Justin. Uh, on yeah, Justin, uh, can you explain kind of – Justin's come from uh, – Talk a little bit about your background because you're not a born and bred uh, Microsofty, and I think it, that's very useful in terms of perspective. Talk about kind of a little bit about your history, and then uh, tell us about uh, you know why Microsoft is is it been involved in co-founding this uh, this zone with the rest of us here, uh, and what the what you know how it's how it's viewed as an activity within the portfolio of activities that uh, that Microsoft's involved in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm Justin Colomino. I've been a, a free and open source software lawyer pretty much my whole career. Um, it's um, actually, th this is a, an alignment, so this panel itself is kind of near and dear to my heart. I was a patent litigator as well, um, you know, kind of in the mid-range mid of my career. But So I, I, met, I met Steve probably uh, maybe 12 years ago around the conference table thinking about how we could, you know, stop huge uh, patent buyers from asserting um, against uh, free and open source uh, software communities back when I uh, began my career at the Software Freedom Law Center. Um, and, you know, it, 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 as I moved my career into patent litigation, you know, there was no uh, greater joy for me than invalidating a patent on, on various grounds um, when they were asserted against, against, my, against my clients. And then, you know, fast forward a little bit, I always maintained a, a large pro bono practice in the free and open source software space. And, um, I remember uh, Karen, Karen Copenhaver actually worked across the street from me, and we, we met for lunch one day, and she said, hey, there's this job opening um, over at Microsoft to be a, a free and open source software lawyer there. And I said, uh, Microsoft, uh, you really think I should go there? And she said, well, they, they're kind of changing a little bit. And I said to myself, well, you know, if Karen thinks so, then maybe I'll, maybe I'll give them a shot. And this was, you know, five years ago, 2017, we were kind of, just starting to change uh, is the way I put it at, at Microsoft, and um, so I came out here, met the folks, and, and, and I realized that they were they were pretty serious about about you know coming and and, and doing some real um, free and open source uh, software work. 
So, you know, I, I, I took the job, um, even though kind of my initial impression was, you know, kind of, yeah, right, Microsoft, what, what tricks are you trying to, trying to pull now? You know, lo and behold, within, within a year of my joining, uh, Microsoft had joined OIN. And, you know, for, from, from my standpoint, that was a shock. Because OIN, in a lot of ways, it's no secret, you know, Microsoft and, and the uh, free and open source software community were a little bit of, at odds in the past, and in particular, you know, with respect to with respect to patents. And so the idea that Microsoft, you know, so quickly would come and join OIN with the idea of creating this safe space um, of real collaboration between large companies and the free and open source software community more broadly to say, look, hands off this stuff. This stuff's really important. And if we want to promote innovation, then what we need to do is we all need to agree that these packages, the Linux system definition, which is at the heart of OIN, Linux kernel, and, and many of its uh, packages and, and language ecosystems, that, that should be free for people to use and to innovate on and we should all kind of come together and agree that that should be a safe space. And so, and so it, I think it's just a natural evolution thinking about you know, this OSS zone for Microsoft to support that additional safe space. So it's not just, so it's everybody's kind of come together and agreed, look, this is important stuff, we shouldn't be touching it. But then all of a sudden others have come in, these you know, people, non-practicing non, uh, uh, non entities have come in with patents that bought on the open market and said, hey, you know, we really think you should be paying us for that if you're using Linux or, you know, something in the Linux system definition or open source. And the response is kind of like, you know, no, this is really important stuff. And we all need to do our part to make sure that innovation isn't stifled because of these low quality patents that are coming and being asserted. So I think the the it's just a kind of a carryover of this idea of having a key safe space to drive innovation um, on this really important baseline technology that, that has really shown the world that uh, innovation can be done in the open and uh, we shouldn't be holding it up. Thanks, Justin. I think it's really important that uh, uh, we think about the journey of how we got here. 17 years ago, monolithic threat, Microsoft was uh, I'd say beyond uh, testy. Um, they were openly aggressive, uh, uh, antagonistic, looking to slow or stall the progress of Linux uh, and open source. And so um, that's the world that I entered into when I came uh, to run OIN, I IBM, Red Hat at the time, Novell, Sony, NEC, Philips, uh, had gotten together to fund this later. Um, uh, Google and Toyota joined uh, as funding members. And the whole idea was to have this paternalistic model where you didn't have to pay anything, but what you had to do was put your core patents at risk in a cross license with, along with everybody else, so you give as good as you get. And we neutralized the risk around what is absolutely fundamental, coming at, fundamental technology coming out of the, the most significant projects in the world. Uh, and then to be able to have this unique capability of expanding the scope of the license uh, which for those of you who've done licensing, it's, uh, it's never been done before, that you have a successful license where the licensor has the ability to expand the scope of the license without approval of the licensee. But what that's a testament to is the unusual nature of the open source community and the trust that the community developed and the members, now we have 3,750 members, it's the largest patent non-aggression community in history. Um, all these members are buying into the notion that we are going to act uh, within their interests to be able to expand the scope of the license, to reduce risk uh, that's, rep that's represented by community members. Um, and that's, we've, we've, we've supported adoption. I, I remember talking to Jim Zemlin uh, 13 years ago, 14 years ago. He was talking about, you know, kind of m not moving beyond Linux, but basically allowing for more entities, large and small, to come together to be able to support new project development, to professionalize at, at scale uh, project management. Um, and that obviously with 380 plus projects, or however many projects Linux Foundation has, uh, they've been very successful at doing that. 
Um, but one of the, the, the pathways to, to, to doing that, one of the choices that was made was to largely, almost exclusively use uh, uh, permissive licenses. Permissive licenses that don't have a lot of uh, patent integrity in terms of protections. And so OAN became a natural partner of Linux Foundation uh, to live in the slipstream of Linux Foundation's, the, the creativity of the project participants. As Project Core code came out, we would protect it, put it in what, what Justin described as a Linux system definition, which is the zone of patent protection. And that project could, the, the people who are participating in the project could feel more comfortable about adoption. One of the problems 17 years ago was large companies were not comfortable uh, part participating in, in open source at scale because they were afraid of patent risk litigation, the patent risk largely associated with litigation. And Microsoft was waving its flag about, you know, don't, don't come, come here because we're going to sue you. We've got lots of patents. Lo and behold, as Justin described, um, GitHub acquisition is one of the facilitative elements, but uh, clearly with leadership like John Gossman and, and Tyler Fuller who are completely authentic individuals inside Microsoft whom I've gotten to know and have really felt this sense of embrace uh, from them because they have, in, in essence, they and a handful of other people have helped turn an organization around that was very much focused on, on the notion of antagonism and taxing uh, and raising the cost of ownership of the use of open source. And so it, it takes change leaders like that to be able to affect this kind of change uh, in the most successful proprietary software company in the world. Um, so that's no mean feat that they have made this shift and it, it comes from the top down uh, through the CTO and, and throughout the organization now. And so it's the d journey of redemption, as I call it, has been a, has been a wonderful thing to watch. And we have been, we have been a partner w in, the, in that journey. Uh, probably no more single act other than the joining OIN. Uh, and exposing all 62,000 of its patents to cross-license uh, driven by OIN, which had been set up really to counter the effect of, uh, uh, of Microsoft in the, in the, in the patent space. Um, this was a sense of, uh, of, of a new reality that we were, t we, were lit we were participating in. But what that also meant is that we could work with Microsoft, we could work with IBM, we could work with other companies and the LF to be able to solve problems that existed that were beyond the Microsoft threat. Because now we had a clear space and it's what happens after what comes next. And what happened is that we recognized that where the, th where the threat was going, where the risk was going, and I'll have Karen talk a little bit about the protections. Sh Sean touched on it, but the protections that that we are unique to how this zone works relative to the other zones, because there are 12 other zones that these guys protect. Uh, Meta is also a supporter of this zone and, and a couple of other companies. Um, so it's not just us, but there are some others. Uh, but Karen uh, negotiated on behalf of the LF as its attorney to make sure that, that there was awareness by by uh, unified of exactly who we, who we need to protect. We don't, we don't leave people behind or separate and create a, uh, a hierarchy of, uh, of value in the open source world when we do these kinds of things. And I think it's a very important point that I'll have Karen talk about now. I'll talk about it briefly and then, Sean, you can talk about how it works in practice. But um, th this was different. I mean, this was so different. I, I, it, the idea that these companies would come together and do something, once again, that they could not do on their own. I mean, any one company undertaking the work that Sean's company does would not have worked as well, if it had worked at all. And the exposures that would have come from individual companies taking these actions and um, uh, would have, would have it certainly slowed things down as they had to think about all the ramifications to every company of what was going to happen. So to have this independent organization make these decisions and to um, you know look out for the entire uh, zone, for the entire uh, what was in the open source zone, um, and do that without having to go negotiate with anybody. I mean, it's you know they we don't they they don't go and talk to six companies and say, do you really want me to do this? In fact, that's completely uh, against everything that they can and should do. But they were able to move quickly in the patent space because they were given that freedom. So that's one thing that's really different. But I think what Keith is talking about is that when we looked at the li at the standard license, 
um, for, uh, for the, the zones that they work on. These are companies that step in and pay money in order for their uh, area of technology to be looked after by Unified. And so those companies that paid to participate are the ones that would potentially get a license if, if something was settled. And so settlement was, I don't know if it was an, a, a common option, but it was a possible option. Um, it, in that you know you, you would have these are the companies that would that would end up with a license if we settle this out it's a lot of companies but it's here's the here's the companies that would get the license uh, we can make this all go away you know with you the uh, the the patent troll if you know if we can settle this up well you know I came and said you know I I don't feel great about that because um, we don't get licenses for part of the community. You know, if you if you negotiate a license, you really have to negotiate a license for everybody we can articulate, and it's and it's difficult to write down everybody you would want to get a license. You know, so we wrote down as much as we could think of, and Sean, I, I'm not sure whether I was talking to you at the time or I was talking to somebody else that said, you know, this eliminates settlement as an opportunity. I mean, how could I possibly negotiate a settlement with this with this set of licensees? So this means that I go to the mat on everything. And we said, that's, that's okay with us. That's okay with us. But it's, it's an order of magnitude more in terms of, I think, what we handed you as an assignment because we wanted to make sure that this was seen as being entirely supportive of the community. So once again, OIN is building this community of support with, with all of these licensees to bring everybody in, the people who are here now, the industries who are coming. It's all about bringing everybody together to focus on a response. And if you limit that response to a specific set of licensees, it really works against the concept that this is a community response. So I don't know how hard we made your life, but I, I remember when I first mentioned how many licensees there were going to be, it, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, intuitively obvious to you that that was the right answer. Well, I mean, we always like new challenges. Um, there's, there wasn't a solution to, um, uh, you know, the interesting thing about patent trolls, I would say, is they're actually very rational creatures. <laughs> um, they're actually one of the most rational creatures you'll ever see in the world because they're really only special purpose vehicles to make money. That's really why they exist in the first place. They buy a patent, then they assert it against a bunch of companies that they've already determined they can go after. And they have kind of a, you know, usually a spreadsheet with a very nice, you know, flow chart of how they would expect things to come out uh, with an expected uh, recovery amount at the end of it and an ROI associated for their investors, just like any other kind of financial plan. Um, but there's no people involved. It's just purely about asserting patents and settling, you know, in the end. So it's just about making money, which, you know, is negative and positive because they're completely rational when it comes to settling, too. Uh, the numbers that they, you know, want to settle for are based on just getting the, the financial reward. It's nothing that they think personally about the patent or, you know, the invention or what's going on with the company or anything like that. Um, so in, just to clarify, like we, we have actually, as a standard member at Unified, and you know, any small company can join as a standard member. And they actually do get the settlements too. So like paid and unpaid get the settlements in any zone, for example, that they participate in. Um, and, and so like companies that are under, for example, 25 million in revenue at Unified can always join for free. And they get all the same benefits as a large company that join the same zone. Um, and, and the idea is that everyone should benefit and the small guys just shouldn't, you know, get asserted against in the first place, in our opinion. Um, but secondly, um, ultimately, it's all about deterrence. And ultimately, the goal is really to say, like, we're not going to allow any of these kinds of assertions to happen against anyone. Because if it starts with one company, it's just like a rolling ball. Once they get one settlement, then they'll get a couple others, and a couple others, and a couple others. And so our goal is to nip it in the bud right before it starts. Like, even if they're not asserting against a member, or, you know, what's important to us is to make sure that we stop it at the source. Because once it goes down that route of getting settlements, it's too late a lot of the time. And a lot of times they smart start with small companies. They might start with a really small company, 
who like will you know contact us and go well, what the hell's going on like why do they come in it's just bad luck sometimes so we we like to do that and they do settle quite often actually about a third of the time that we actually challenge a patent um and a non-practicing entity or troll will settle with us which actually surprised us initially but kind of made sense in the end because we realize that they are rational in the way they think about things. But on the other hand, when you have such a large community of companies and such a large swath of technology, that becomes a lot harder. But it's okay, because in the end, the goal is really to deter. That's the goal, ultimately. And you know, when we file, for example, in challenge patents, which we do regularly in open source, we know and they know that it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And that's, that's, that's part of the goal to say it's gonna cost you a lot of money. So just like they kind of go to companies and say, hey, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to figure out whether this patent's bad, do you really wanna do this? It's gonna take time away for your engineers and for you to do other stuff, and you're gonna be thinking about it all the time and pissed off about it all the time. Why don't you just give me a little cash and I'll go away and then you can just go on your merry way and we won't have to think about it. We kinda can go to them and say basically exactly the same thing. <laughs> usually <laughs> and there's nothing they can do about it uh and you know that's that's the great part is that we can go to these guys that really don't have a natural kind of you know i would say you know person that that's a counterweight against them i guess you would say in most cases and literally tell them the same speech that they give companies that they're asserting against to them and tell them your patent's not good this is the reason why do you really want to go through this it's going to cost a lot of money to you and you're probably going to end up losing it anyways in the end. Why don't you just either settle out or just give up? And that just creates a lot of pressure on them that they normally don't have to feel. Yeah, I think I in just in terms of numbers, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there have been like 30-plus wins that you guys have had against you know technologies that everybody knows, um, You know whether it's a Kubernetes, a Docker, or, or Hadoop, or Kafka, um, kernel technologies. They're just uh, replete with wins that they've been able to record and chalk up and, and put on our side of the ledger. And so these are situations where those patents are not being used to, to torment, terrorize, and antagonize the community. And we're winning the battle. But this is a rifle shot. This is about, this is a, an activity that's very focused on specific patents that represent a specific level of threat. Uh, and so we're not just just sweeping out relatively unimportant patents or poor, or just what we think are, you know, oh, this area is maybe not so significant, but we'll pick that one off. This is like the core of, of most of the significant projects that we see. And so, um, you know, it's, I think it's a very important win in terms of the collaboration that we've had to be able to support. We, we, this is our third year of supporting uh, Unified, and we see continued growth, continued opportunity, because it, there's an attractive nuisance that's out there, and it's P PAEs, patent assertion entities, that have patents that read on critical core functionality of the open source world. Uh, I, I just want to say one other thing. Um, just, just um, you know, just kind of me looping on something that, that Karen was saying around how important it is that these type that this type of protection extends to the you know the broader community, not just you know people who are um, you know supporting um, the. In order for open source innovation to work, you need collaborators. You need people who are willing to pick up the technology, use it, and then after using it, you know, improve it. And so to have a settlement only benefit a few people in that space or a few companies in that space wouldn't serve that purpose. One of the beauties of the innovation is that anybody can contribute and anybody can make an improvement that everybody um, can benefit from. And in that way, Microsoft and others, Microsoft is in the same you know, shoes as, as any other user and any other collaborator in a lot of these spaces. And so to make sure that this umbrella of protection extends to that broader base really serves the purposes of exciting and um, in incentivizing that innovation um, on this, you know, core broad technology. That's a good point, Justin. I think we'll we'll end on that point. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I think we're over time already. So if there are any questions in the hallway, we're glad to, to take them or if somebody wanted to give us a chance to, to respond to a question now. Yeah, 
a good point. And we're collectively spending millions of dollars a year uh, to be able to fight this fight. Um, so to your point, and this is the most expensive because of what we described, these are the most expensive, this is the most expensive zone per incident uh, by far because they have to take all of these cases to term. The other ones they're able to settle three or four months in, they settle, they're not taking them to term. And so we have the challenge of protecting an entire community instead of protecting a club of companies. Uh, so it's a very unusual horizontal zone as well. Most of them are vertical zones, but this is across entire specs, swaths of, of, of technology. It's financial services, it's, uh, it's you know, security, it's cloud, it's everything, it's telecom, it's video, it's, it's everything that is near and dear to your, you know, your kind of company's future success uh, is, is, is at risk here. And so this is why we want to continue to invest in this with the LF, with Microsoft, with Meta and other companies that are in this. But we want to see, to Mike's point, this community grow so we can do more good things with our, through our partnership uh, with Unified. So thank you very much uh, for being here and, and listening to the story.